looks like the numbers have slowly stopped increasing. We have about 120 board members with us today. So thank you very much for joining our monthly webinar series. Uh, today is hosted by Chris Gillick, attorney um, here local to Charlotte. Um, my name is Ben Rhodes. I'm the senior vice president with CAMS. Uh, I oversee the Charlotte operation and um, help work with a number of other regional offices. Um, Chris Gellick is a practicing attorney licensed in North and South Carolina, and I believe Maryland as well. So he's gonna be talking a little bit about um, what happens when you hear the phrase, you will be hearing from my lawyer. Uh, as a reminder, this is a monthly series that we've been hosting and uh, we are placing these videos online at the camsmgt.com website. Uh, there's a webinar section so um, certainly hope you share this information with your board members, other, other board members that you work with. So um, Chris, I will turn this over to you. Um, thank you again. And um, I guess we will look to ask questions um, at a period in the webinar. So we'll stop about halfway through for some Q&A and then we'll have Q&A at the end. So please feel free to um, ask questions throughout and we'll stop and ask, answer those. So thank you, and I'll, I'll start sharing the screen. Okay. Um, well, thanks everybody. While the screen's coming up, um, again, my name's Chris Galwick. So those of you who have not heard me speak, uh, I speak at, at a number of these things throughout the year. Um, I was asked to, to discuss a topic uh, regarding the, the what happens when, when someone comes in and says, I'm gonna sue you. And, you know, that happens more frequently than we all probably uh, know about. But the, the, the point of this one, uh, this, this seminar is really going to be the, um, what, hap what personal liability do directors potentially carry? Um, and just by one more way of introductory remarks, um, I uh, have been practicing HOA law since 2011. And despite that, I had a momentary lack of clarity a couple of years ago and agreed to be on my HOA board uh, and, and had another momentary lack of clarity and agreed to run again. And unfortunately I was elected. So I've sat on that side of the table now, not just as a lawyer on this side, but also as a board member now for a few years. Um, so I, I guess what I, what I, what I would say is I've learned a lot sitting on that side of the table and, and hopefully what you'll get out of this is, uh, you know, we can talk, we're going to talk about a number of things uh, that board members normally, they're, they're facing more threats of, of lawsuits, of liability for what they do, um, it, real imaginary uh, personal liability, not just for against the association, but them personally and these threats um, it can worry people. Um, and Ben, if you want to go ahead. Uh, and, and they take the form, normally these are in the form of disgruntled owners who don't like a decision the board made, don't like how the board is spending money, uh, or just don't like the board members uh, and, and think that they can do a better job. Um, and what we're focused on then for this is individual director liability. Um, obviously, associations can be sued, uh, but where, where do we as board members need to be careful so that we don't open ourselves up personally? Um, so uh, Ben, if you wanna go on, the, the our, our, yeah. So we, these threats can be worrisome, they can be distracting, the, uh, and they can take away from our focus on what needs to be done. So, we're going to have a, we have a bit of a roadmap. I'm going to tell you what we're going to talk about. The first thing we're going to discuss is whether the threat is the threat real. And really answering that question is what's the issue. And are they trying to rattle you? Are they trying to get you off topic? Are they trying to get you to listen to them? Or is there something really uh, liability wise that we need to be concerned about? Then we're going to talk briefly, uh, well, maybe a little more in depth about uh, what statutory and document protections exist to help shield you so that you can do your job uh, as a volunteer. <laughs> uh, if you're like me, you get paid very handsomely to sit there in these rooms and, and make these decisions. I'm joking. Uh, no, one, no one gets paid. We all volunteer our time for this. Um, and so 
but we're going to walk into it and we want some, we want some protection so that we know when we make a decision, you know, it's not, someone's not going to try and take our house from us. Um, so there's, there's some protections. We're going to talk about the business judgment rule. We're going to talk about uh, indemnity and we're going to talk a little bit about insurance. And then finally, you know, we're going to sum up with a couple of things. You're always going to have conflict because when you deal with people, you're going to deal with conflict. So we're going to talk about what, what's an HOA issue and what's not, uh, how the board should uh, communicate with the membership after decisions are made, and what resources and how to use them are available to board members. So uh, the first question, we'll go right to it, is I always get the question, can they sue us for this? I, I can't tell you how many times a year I'm on a, I'm on a phone call with a board and they ask me, well, well, can we got a we got a threatening email from an owner that says they're going to sue us? Can they really sue us for that? The answer is absolutely. And the reason is absolute is because you can sue anyone nowadays for anything. We live in a litigious society. Um, anyone can file a lawsuit. It simply requires you drafting complaint, paying the fee, and serving. And boom, you're in a lawsuit. But that's not the question. Um, the, the real question is: if they sue me, can I be held liable? Um, and the answer there is the classic lawyer answer. It depends. It depends on what's going on. Um, if it's, if it's something that has to do with association business, am I bearing liability so that if I'm sued, I might have to cut a check? Um, that, that's the question we as board members really need to answer. So what we're going to talk about first is practical experience. Now we've all been in a room. When someone has said, I've contacted my lawyer and he says you're wrong, or my lawyer says I'm right, uh, my, my interpretation's right, I've contacted them and, and you're going to hear from them. That normally, 90, I would say 95% of the time, maybe even more, means that I haven't contacted my lawyer because it's too expensive, but I want to scare you. And so they're throwing that language out there to try to rattle you, to try to get you to succumb to their wishes. Um, you know, they'll say, yeah, again, we'll go back to, to they'll say, I've contacted my lawyer or uh, my lawyer looked at this and he says, I'm right. And, and that's all they say. But they'll, they'll come in and say, uh, they'll, they'll give you an interpretation. So my lawyer looked at this and, the, you know, the, the documents mean this. They mean A. And then they won't say anything else. Um, when someone says they've contacted their lawyer, at that point, you always ask who it is. And then you tell them we can't talk to you anymore. Have your lawyer contact our attorney. 95% of the time that ends the discussion, because as I said, most of the time when you hear these things, it's just to rattle you. Contacting a lawyer, getting an opinion costs money. Uh, we, we, we do charge for what we do. Um, and so that's, that, that's normally the end of it. Always, however, when someone makes that assertion to you that they've contacted a lawyer or that their lawyer says they're right, contact your manager and contact your lawyer. Run the, the issue by them to make sure that they, you are right. And, or if there is something there, Again, most of the time, you'll, it'll probably be a 10 minute conversation. It's normally, yeah, don't worry about it. Occasionally, if there's something there, that, if, then we'll deal with it. So there's a thousand scenarios we could talk about. Um, and and what, I, what I've done here for this webinar is we've made a couple of videos. You'll see them. The first one is coming up here on the next slide. And just to, just to introduce that, um, it's a scenario that uh, actually happened. Um, and, and you'll, I'll talk about it afterwards, but the two people you see in the video, one is a board member. She's also my paralegal. And the other one is a, is a homeowner, uh, who, who's playing a part of a homeowner who is, uh, also our marketing director. So we can proceed there and then we'll talk about it after. Kate, hi, Kate, director. Can I speak with you? Hey, Karen, how are you? I'm good. I see that the association is putting on a haunted trail this year during the COVID. Don't you think that that's a bad idea? Well, we talked about it with the board and there's just, there's a lot of people that just want to get outside. 
We're going to be out in the common area and we're gonna follow social distancing. Well, I have asthma and I live with family that has medical conditions. I don't wanna put them at a higher risk and be exposed just because people can't stay in their homes during a crisis. Well, like I said, we talked to the board and we're gonna follow social distancing. We'll have masks available and hand sanitizer. And we've asked everybody to stay with their family unit. It's really, it's your choice if you want to come. You don't have to. All I can say is if I get infected, you will be hearing from my lawyer and I will sue you personally. <gasps> All right. So let's recap what that was. And that, that is a real life experience. The, the lady on the left was a board member who was accosted outside her home after the board this past fall decided to open the common area to allow for a haunted trail. They do this every year. Um, the board makes the announcement that you can use it. It's, you must follow social distancing rules. You must wear a mask. Um, and obviously it's, if you feel like coming, you can. If you're unsafe, if you feel unsafe, don't come. The member uh, approaches her um, outside her, uh, her house in the neighborhood and, and they have this discussion. So we're gonna have a poll here in a minute asking really what the liability you think there is. Um, I'm gonna put that poll up here just now. And the, and the question is, for those of you who may ha not be seeing it or, or just gonna read through it, could the board member be personally liable if Karen contracts COVID? Um, and the votes are coming in. Um, and we've got a couple that say yes, 81, 82, something in there percent saying no. Um, something in that, and their votes are still coming in, but the, that's good, okay. We'll let those continue to, okay. So it's what it was, uh, in case you can't see it. Uh, the question is, could the board member be personally liable if Karen contracts COVID? There were two yeses. There were 88 no's, which is 77% of the audience, 22 maybes, which is 19. And, and the, 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 the last one is interesting. She deserves to get covered with that attitude. She got exactly three votes on that one. So that, that's, a, that's a, good, a good spread. We're going to talk about that scenario throughout this, my, the next part of this presentation. And I'll tell you what I think about that scenario then uh, after we go through it. So we talked about previously before that, what threats, what, you know, do we take this seriously or don't we? Um, and so the threats that we need to take seriously at board members are when you hear the words fiduciary duty and breach. Um, and, and we're going to explain what that is. Almost all real claims can be brought into this issue. Um, a, a claim for a breach of fiduciary duty is basically a claim that the directors are not acting in good faith or not acting uh, prudently or not acting in the best interest of the corporation. And North Carolina and South Carolina both have nonprofit corporation acts that have a section that specifically defines what a director's fiduciary duty is. If, for example, the association gets a, a fair housing complaint or there is a fair debt violation or perhaps uh, heaven forbid, the theft of funds. Those all seem to be causes of action or claims, but what do they fall under? Well, they fall under this breach of fiduciary duty, and it's fairly clear. Um, theft is an intentional act. Theft, uh, theft of association funds certainly would fall into the breach of fiduciary duty category because you're certainly not acting in good faith if you're stealing money, and you're certainly not acting in the best interest of the corporation. Um, intentional torts like defamation. Um, and we're going to talk about that towards the end of this. I actually had the experience, experience with that. Um, is another one that wouldn't be covered. Um, arbitrary enforcement. And you'll see some, you'll, we're going to get into that a little more uh, on the next slide. Uh, it can be, uh, depending upon uh, what the issues are, can be a, a breach of fiduciary duty. Um, now, Again, let me just recap. Directors must act, this is in statute, must act in good faith. What does that mean? That means you're acting with, a, with an idea of doing the right thing, um, whatever, based upon whatever decision you're having to make. 
with the ordinary prudent care of an ordinary prudent person in the best interest of the corporation. And going on to the next slide, boards, when they make decisions in fulfilling their fiduciary duty, board members are allowed to rely on competent officers. Now, every one of you, and I hope you all understand the distinction, I'm gonna get into it uh, right now. There's a difference between an officer and a board member. I hear all the time, uh, we're going to have an annual meeting, we're gonna elect our board president. No, you're gonna elect a director. The directors then appoint the officers who are the president, treasurer, that type of thing. But officers, for example, your treasurer. If your treasurer is competent, meaning they know what's going on with the association finances, perhaps they're a CPA, maybe they're not, they don't have to be, um, you can rely on what the officer is telling the board when a decision is made regarding finances. Experts, such as lawyers, uh, are all experts, some of us more than others, I guess. Um, accountants and vendors. Vendors meaning, for example, contractors. If you have to do a repair to say the clubhouse roof, or if you're in a townhome or condo association, the, associate, the building roofs, you're entitled to and allowed to rely on the subcontract or the contractor and the subcontractor's opinion on what needs to be done. You're also allowed to rely on, when you make decisions, committees of the association if the committee reasonably merits confidence. And here's what I mean by that. If the committee was formed, for example, as a finance committee to oversee the finances of the association, you're allowed to rely on their recommendations, not just those of the treasurer, but also the recommendations of that committee. Uh, a landscaping committee, an architectural committee, that's a big one. You're entitled to rely on those as long as you believe that they're acting with merit, meaning uh, they know what they're talking about. Have they reviewed the plan for architectural issues? Have they reviewed the plans? They've reviewed plans in the past. They know what the restrictions say. You're entitled to rely on them. And this is where the protection comes in because both of the North and South Carolina statute have a, a section in there that we use a common law terms called the business judgment rule. And what I've underlined in this slide is the business judgment rule. A director is not liable if he or she performed the duties of his office in compliance with that section. Here's what that means. If you're acting in good faith with reasonable care in the best interest of the corporation, and if appropriate, you relied on competent officers, experts, or committees, then you can make a good decision a bad decision, a stupid decision. And if you did, if you complied with all the things I listed, you will not be personally liable if you are sued. Now, that's a big category. That's a big rule, but it is there for a purpose. And it's one where the Court of Appeals in both states have talked about it. Um, and we'll get to that uh, in a slide or two. Uh, if we could go on to the next, we're going to, there, there's, what are their potential risks? And there's dozens of potential risks to breach uh, fiduciary duty. Um, I'm, I've got a few examples. Failure to maintain the common area and or other areas required to be maintained by the HOA. If you're in a condominium, you have exterior and townhomes, you have exterior repairs to make. Uh, you're supposed to keep the north common area in good repair, whatever that means. If you do not allot proper funding, if you do not um, collect, if you don't budget properly, you don't use the reserves correctly and don't take collection activity um, to, to collect perhaps delinquent against delinquent owners, that could be a breach of duty. I'm saying could, because whether something is a breach of duty in the end is probably something for a trier of fact or a court or a jury. Taking out, this is a big one, the third, taking action outside the scope of duties, uh, action that it appears arbitrary, selective enforcement, for example, can be a breach. In fact, I will tell you it most likely is a breach. Um, taking action that shows a director has a personal grudge. I'm gonna talk about that, uh, an example of that later on in this uh, presentation. Um, all of that, that's going to definitely lie outside your fiduciary duty. Taking an action that, award, that involves a conflict of interest. Now, there is a conflict of interest section in both states' nonprofit corporation, Act, North and South Carolina. 
Uh, and I gave an example of awarding a landscape contract to a director's company. So the director operates a landscape business and you award the contract to them. That is inherently a conflict of interest. Does that mean that he can't be awarded the contract? Not necessarily, because there is a section of, in, in both statutes that talk about if a conflict occurs, it may be okay if the deal's fair and it's disclosed. But um, I will tell you, even if the contract is fair and it is disclosed to the membership, it simply doesn't look good. And one thing we want to make sure um, well, on the last one, then there's a general lack of, of governments, governance and enforcement. And I'm going to hold on that one because I'm going to talk about a specific case we dealt with. Uh, but going back to the conflict um, part real quick, the, the issue of the conflict of interest is this. Everyone has a conflict serving on the board. Everybody wants to make sure their property values are enhanced. Everybody wants to make sure that the uh, that the covenants are enforced and everyone benefits from it. So everyone has a conflict, but the issue for conflicts isn't so much that it's, are we awarding, is, it, is someone getting awarded a contract? Is, is something, is some director benefiting from, a, from an association decision that in the end uh, brings that conflict to light? That's a problem. And, and so that is definitely something that would be concerned about for breach of fiduciary duty. And the general lack of governments, uh, that is enforcement. Um, I'm going to uh, give you a brief example of what I'm talking about on that one. My association just finished a lawsuit wherein we as a board, uh, as an association, filed a lawsuit against an owner for running a Airbnb VRBO uh, out of her house, our restrictions limited rentals to a minimum of six months. She was renting weekly, uh, sometimes every weekend, uh, sometimes multiple rooms at once to different people. Um, if we, we I, I had a discussion with my board and if we had not pursued enforcement of that issue, in my opinion, we would have been breaching our fiduciary duty. And the reason for that is the restrictions are there for enforcement. The, re the restrictions are there to be followed. If we choose, if we chose not to enforce that one, one, we are then basically sent telling the membership of the association that that uh, rent leasing section has no value and it shouldn't be enforced. We don't have the power to do that. If that leasing section is not to be enforced, what should be done is the restrictions amended through the proper amendment procedure. So we had that discussion and we decided to fulfill our fiduciary duty we needed to pursue action. We had a number of options available to us. We spoke with counsel and chose to file this lawsuit. And the result of that lawsuit was that we got an admission that we were right from the complaining owner among other things. And the owner ended up moving during the lawsuit. So that actually resolved the problem as well. Um, so that's an example of where a lack of governance had we not taken action, I believe we would have been exposed to a claim from other members of the association for breach of fiduciary duty. So the business judgment rule uh, helps uh, is, is use it as a guide as to making all of your decisions. Now, if you get sued, um, and, I, and as I said, anyone can sue anyone for any reason. Well, what protections are there in government documents or perhaps via statute to help you? North Carolina and South Carolina Nonprofit Corporation Act, and the sections are there for you, have uh, available indemnity. And if those who don't know what indemnity is, indemnity basically is a promise to pay if you get sued. The normally, and bylaws that I draft have this, normally your bylaws contain indemnity language that helps protect board members, the volunteer board members, uh, in the event that they have to, that they are subject to a claim, that they will be indemnified or reimbursed. And if you work it out right, paid, they, they will never, hopefully the directors will never have to pay anything. It will just be uh, paid by the association. For any out-of-pocket expenses, that would be attorney's fees, court costs, et cetera. And potentially, hopefully, if this won't happen, but if there is a judgment in some sort of monetary amount, the association would agree to indemnify the director. Now, 
The code sections there specifically address two issues, two part, two things. First, directors in Section 51, 8.51, 8-51, uh, basically provides that directors may be indemnified if they acted in good faith, if they believed that their action was in the best interest of the corporation, and that the action was not opposed to the HOA's best interest. What does that sound like? That sounds like the business judgment rule. And that's really what it is. So section 51 uh, of 55A 851 and 3331851 provides that you that directors may be indemnified if they're sued, if they acted if they acted according to the business judgment rule. It seems to make sense. Um, and what which is why again it's so important uh, to follow. <clears throat> To, to make sure you're fulfilling your fiduciary duty and thinking through the, your, the processes with every decision. Section 52 uh, basically provides, unless limited by the Articles of Incorporation, an association, and it says corporation, but it's the same, it's in our case, we're talking about associations, shall, that's a must, they must indemnify a director if the director is victorious in a proceeding where they were sued for something they did as a director. So even if your bylaws are, are silent, um, you're still going there. The association will still likely have to, will most likely have to indemnify a director um, for their out-of-pocket costs. That would be attorney's fees, court costs, if they're sued. Um, and that seems to make sense. These, the, the, if you follow the logic on that, a, a director, everyone involved here uh, are volunteers. Uh, why should you have to put your own money out there to defend something you did while you were acting, uh, using your best business judgment and fulfilling your fiduciary duty in this role? So um, the, the association, most associations already have that language in their bylaws. If it's not in there, while I understand the statute and the code allow for that, um, I recommend talking to your attorney and amending your bylaws to, to include that section. Um, in that process, you can talk with your attorney about it, or I can certainly talk to you about it at some point. Um, I think it's important language to have in there. It gives directors peace of mind. Um, and the reality is everyone on this call, I hope knows that finding volunteers, especially good people who know what they're doing to fill these positions can be taxing and very, very difficult. And if, if, the, if potential directors, if potential people that can fill these spots are hesitant because they feel they're going to be left in the wind without any protection from the association, you're not going to be able to get very many people to fill uh, openings. So um, I want to talk about insurance briefly, and then we'll take some questions um, if we have any to start. Hopefully everybody here on this call, uh, on this webinar, has is aware of directors and officers insurance. That protects the personal assets of directors, okay? So if you have a directors and officers policy, your, your personal assets are gonna be pr protected in, by the insurance company. Uh, you're going to be defended by that insurance company. They're gonna hire a lawyer to defend you if you're sued. Now, the key here, of course, is it's not required to be obtained in either state. Um, the uh, for some reason, the North Carolina Plan Community Act and Condominium Act, they talk about hazard insurance, they talk about liability insurance, and then it basically says any other insurance that you want to get. Uh, most covenants do not directly require directors and office insurance being purchased. It is my recommendation that if you don't have it, absolutely get it contact and in your insurance agent, insurance direct, directors and officers insurance policies are not generally very expensive. And, you know, that insurance will cover in a couple of that, both, both monetary and non-monetary uh, events. Meaning if an owner is suing you for money, uh, that insurance will, will kick in to defend you and pay the claim. If there is a judgment uh, normally, these policies are a million dollars, something like that. Uh, for non-monetary losses, um, I've actually had a discussion with an insurance agent today 
on a lawn, non-monetary loss, for example, could be something where someone is suing the board because you didn't interpret the covenants right and they're going to be affected down the line. So they can't put a, mon a money, uh, money uh, amount on it right now, but they will later. If you buy a million dollars coverage, um, you're going to be covered uh, by that insurance policy and by that. Uh, so you're going to have a defense and any judgment paid. Now, again, if you're acting outside of your fiduciary duty, you may have a problem getting coverage for, for a specific event. And a director who is accused of theft or a director who is accused of taking personal action against a specific homeowner and that homeowner sues is probably going to not have that coverage. That coverage will be denied because it normally that coverages do not, there's I, absolutely they don't cover intentional actions by a board or by a director who is acting outside of their scope of duty as a director. Um, ben, you want to see if we have any questions at this point? Oh. We do have a few that have come in, so I'll, I'll ask um, a couple and then we'll okay. see. Uh, so in a condo as president, I often see violations or get stopped by owners that want to discuss board business or complain. What obligation do I have to report or talk to folks outside of a meeting? I would like to enjoy the property as a homeowner and not be the violation police. Um, <laughs> You know, is there is there a liability or what what can you tell me about? Um, well, that is that's a actually something that I dealt with when people found out. And when I moved into my association that I was an HOA attorney, I, I uh, fielded a lot of people walking their dogs when I was out cutting my lawn. Uh, they'd come out and, hey, Chris is out. Let's ask him a question. Um, and, and that, unfortunately, is uh, something we all have to deal with. There's a part of the Plan Community Act that requires your name and address to be published to the membership within 30 days of your election. So you can't hide from them. Now, what can you and can't you disclose? Um, your, the association action regarding violations, for example, or collections, those are confidential. That's confidential information. If a, if a person, if a member of the association comes to you and say, I want to know what you're doing about a violation for, with Ted's house, your answer should be, I can't tell you that but the board is taking all appropriate action that it can. And if the owner doesn't like that, they should contact their attorney or they should con you can certainly put them in contact with the association's attorney with the understanding that that association attorney should give them the information of the board cannot disclose that it is private, especially the collection issues, whether someone is behind because that is disclosing uh, financial information about another member and whether they're behind could be deemed to be collection action and violate the federal fair debt collection practices. Act. Um, so specific instance of like what's going on with the pool renovation or something, you're probably just gonna have to deal with those questions. Uh, but if there's specific things regarding violations or collections or something like that, my advice would be tell them you can't, uh, you can't answer that question. It's private and uh, just trust that we're doing everything we can. So the, the next one, I think, is relation to your video. Um, in the video, somebody was um, confronting another person face to face. How do you handle that if it was done in the in a letter format? Uh, the, you handle it kind of the the same. Well, we haven't really discussed how how that one would come out, so we'll, let's discuss that real briefly now. In my opinion, what did the what did the board member say? Board members said, we discussed it as a board. We're going to follow the masking and social distancing protocols. It's not a required event. Um, it's come at your own risk. What, what did that explain? That explained that they talked about it and they used their business judgment in making the decision. And so uh, the, the response from the board member there was appropriate. And in the situation where something like that would come in writing, a response would be, the board appreciates your, your question, we appreciates your concern. This is certainly not a required event. We've made a, a business judgment decision based upon all the factors that we considered, including social distancing, et cetera. And we are going to continue with the event. That would be how I would recommend a response. 
With respect to collections, can the board be held liable for any reason if we choose to turn off common utilities or privileges, um, so water, cable, pool, parking? Um, we have situations where payments have been late the past 12 of 20 quarters and currently have not paid the last two quarters of association dues. So it sounds like some delinquent owners um, mm -hmm. initiated putting liens on the property, and, and, but that has prompted um, that hasn't prompted payment by the owners. Is the board liable for either placing the lien or not placing the lien? Is there liability? Well, you have the lien rights per statute. So placing a lien for someone who is delinquent uh, is not going to open any individual board member or the association as a whole to liability, assuming your accounting is correct. Um, so the issue that I have with what you said, Ben, and the question is, they've been behind for 12 to 20 quarters. That is a long time. Um, and I am sure the members who are paying their assessments on time are wondering what's going on. Um, I will tell you, you can, it is, you can, if the association is providing the service, and there is a specific section in the North Carolina Plan Community Act and the North Carolina Condominium Act that addresses this. South Carolina, different issue, and I'll address that in a second. But for North Carolina, if the association is providing a service, an amenity, there is a, there is a specific procedure where you can stop that service. Uh, you need to have a hearing. You need to put them on notice that there's a result of that hearing. We're going to, for example, cut off the cable, um, and you're going to have to give them time to cure. If the service is being provided by the association, you have the legal right per statute to cut off that service. And because you have a legal right, if you're doing it and you're doing it, you know, you've done it without a grudge and without anything personal going on here, you can document why they haven't paid for 12, 12 quarters, then yes, you can do it. And I would, I submit you're not going to face any personal liability in the association would not face association liability for that action because again, it's protected by statute. You're allowed to do it. Um, however, I recommend I would recommend going to foreclosure. Letting something sit out there that long um, isn't doing your membership any good. But you can also take the other step. And and I will tell you just one other aside. I have an association right now. It's a townhome association that decided it was going to turn off water for non-payment of assessments. They provide the water. Uh, the when they started having hearings on this process using the, uh, the process I described, um, their accounts receivable went down from 60,000 to 5,000. So that got everybody's attention. Um, so it can be a useful tool. I recommend if you're going to do that, you follow the statute language to the letter. For South Carolina, unless it's in your documents that you can turn off that service, I submit to you that you cannot even, and it, those of you in South Carolina, they call it the Wild West for a reason. There is, a, there is a statute in place now, but it does not address this. Um, and so unless, and they, they do not address hearings, they do not address fines, they do not address shutting off of services. So unless it is in your restrictions, I would tell you that you, I would not recommend that you proceed in that fashion. If you need to get enforcement action going um, in South Carolina and your documents do not allow for a hearing or fine, you're probably gonna have to file a lawsuit. If someone is behind in their assessments, you have the lien foreclosure process available to you down there, albeit it's different than in North Carolina. But, and one quick comment on the suspension of services. We had another attorney a few months ago talk about don't violate the six o'clock rule. Um, and so Chris, if you're not familiar with the six o'clock rule, it's, it says sometimes that will end up on the six o'clock news. And so you need to know your audience sometimes. So. <laughs> That's absolutely true. And I, I was, I was uh, not heard it called the six o'clock rule, but I agree with that comment. Well, you know, you may, it, going back to the association I referenced, yeah, they, their accounts receivable dropped substantially, but at the same time, I guarantee you none of those board members wanted to end up on camera. So you really do have to watch it. If you're gonna do it, I suggest you start a consult with your HOA attorney. Um, if you don't have one, I'm happy to talk to you. And, um, you know, make sure that what you're doing is, is allowed and you follow the statute to the letter with the understanding there could be blowback. 
So uh, next one, and we'll probably do about two or three more and then uh, get back to the slides, but uh, trees, one of our favorite topics. In the association that has a lot of common property behind the townhouses, and over time the trees have gotten tall and some are overgrown, and you get a call that a resident may want the trees trimmed or removed uh, from disease or something else. The board member says they're prioritizing trees to be cut, um, and then the tree later falls on the house. Is the board member liable or is the association liable? And how should that be handled? Well, the answer is it depends, um, but I'll, I'll give you the, the, the two minute rundown. Tree law is, is a, it is, it's, a, it's a own area of law. And the basic general rule is if I have a tree on my lot and it falls on your lot, you're responsible for the cleanup on your lot and I'm responsible for the cleanup on my lot and you're responsible for the damage on your lot, et cetera. If on the other hand, you come to me and say your tree looks diseased, it's leaning or the limbs are gonna fall and damage my property, I'm putting you on notice basically that if it falls, I've informed you there's a problem, you're gonna be liable. I then have a duty to investigate whether what I was being told to me is true. And if I don't, uh, and the tree falls and it's proven in some fashion that it was diseased or dead, um, I could be held liable. Putting that in perspective with the, the question regarding the association, if the board of directors has a plan of maintenance in place, Unless there is evidence presented, I would advise that unless there is evidence presented that the trees that are being complained about are diseased, damaged, um, or something of that nature, I do not see automatic liability simply because the, something falls later. Now, if an owner is complaining about overgrown limbs, um, it, it's probably it is prudent it would be a good business judgment decision to have your landscaper and or an arborist go review them, take a look and give you an opinion. The reason for that is you can rely on that opinion. Going back to the business judgment rule, you can rely on your vendors. You can rely on experts. If your arborist come or landscaper even comes back and says, there's nothing wrong here, then there's nothing wrong there. You can rely on that. If a windstorm comes and the limbs fall and damage the person's house, I would, I submit you, the association would not face liability and certainly personally, the board members would not. So. Okay. I'll do one more and then we'll jump back into the slide. So our, our covenants say any member can enforce them. What does that really mean? That really means that a member of the association may bring an action at law to enforce the covenants. If, and, and we're going to, uh, we'll probably get into this in one of the later slides. For example, someone build, I'm gonna take an example from the Andy Griffith show. Someone builds a, uh, a fence on the, on the fence line of the property and the other the person on the other side of the fence has chickens and they're not getting any sun. Barney Fife got into a fight over this. Uh, and Andy Griffith is one of my favorite shows. But anyway, um, so uh, there was a back and forth about it. And they went and got an argument. And Andy came in to save the day and say, why don't, why don't you just make the fence out of chicken wire? Beautiful, beautiful result. So the fence was still up. The chickens were getting their sun and everybody was happy. What could have happened there is one owner could have sued the other one. Um, now, I have no idea what a cause of action would be for chickens not getting sun, but uh, I'm sure they can invent one. Nevertheless, the idea there is um, the association has specific rights. The association has the right to levy fines, to suspend privileges. Why? Because in your covenants, it's going to allow for that. Owners can't fine. Owners can't suspend someone else's access to the pool, for example. But owners can bring an action against another owner in court to enforce whatever they think is, is going on. Now, they use their own money, they pay for their own attorneys, they pay their own court costs, et cetera. But they can do that. Very good. Well, well, we'll let you jump back into the slides. There are a number of questions that have come in, so make sure we save some time at the end. Sure. 
And uh, just a reminder, if you do have questions, please use the Q&A option uh, within the, the screen at the bottom of the Zoom link, so. Okay. So um, every association, uh, as we all know as board members, has a few, uh, I call them Peters, uh, you can call them Peters. Uh, and that's the PITR is the clean version. Uh, it's pain in the rear. Uh, probably 5 to 5 to 10 percent of your membership are Peters. Does, that means no matter what you do, doesn't matter what you say, doesn't matter how you spend the money, doesn't matter what you provide, they will complain and threaten. How do you deal with these people? Because they're the ones that are going to say you'll be hearing from my lawyer. Uh, we deal with it by doing just what I said. You use your best business judgment in every decision. Um, in doing that, you document what you're doing very well. You document the decision, not just what you decided, but also what resources you use to make the decision. That will protect you. In your minutes, you can say something was approved upon review of the landscaping contract and the landscaper's recommendation, we approved, whatever the, the, the view was. That's just an example. Remember that a bad decision is protected. As long as you use your business judgment, you and the association will be protected from potential claims. Um, and there, we'll get into the, the stupid decision part of that here in a little bit, but um, we're gonna go into the second video. It's a little less than a minute um, and then we'll come back. Okay. I think that that wraps up what we were talking about for the board meeting today. Um, Karen, you said you might have something you wanted to talk to us about? Yes. Since my neighbor put up those eyesore of a solar panel, I can't see a thing during the day. From about 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., all they do is reflect a glare into my house. I didn't sign up to live on the surface of the sun. I work from home right now and I just can't concentrate. Well, the panels were approved by the HOA to be installed. They were installed exactly the way that they were approved. Did you try talking to your neighbor? I shouldn't have to approach them. You're not the one who has to wear sunglasses to get a snack from the kitchen. You approve the panels, now you can tell them to fix them. Well, the panels were installed, like I said, according to the guidelines, we can't ask the homeowner to correct something that's not a violation. So I have to keep living under a magnifying glass like an ant, and you refuse to fix the situation? You obviously have a problem with me, and I will hold you responsible. You will be hearing from my attorney. Well, all righty then. <laughs> all right, so let's, let's talk about that one real briefly, as uh, I know time's starting to get tight here. So that scenario, again, was a real scenario, it came across my desk. Um, the owner uh, was approved to install solar panels. Uh, the owner installed them exactly as they were approved. So the association approved them, they put them in exactly that way. Then the neighbor complains about a reflective glare every day from 10 to four. What should the association and the directors do? And we're going into our second poll right now. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see what y'all say. So the, the poll question, in case any of you can't see it, should the board get involved in this issue regarding solar panels and glare? No, who cares? Solar panels look so ugly on a house, the board members should be punished for allowing them in the first place, and yes. And the votes are coming in. Um, it's interesting, no one's doing uh, any, any uh, thing on number three, solar panels look so ugly, so that's interesting. Uh, no one is saying who cares, so good. Um, I will let you know that this, is, this one, this scenario came in from a manager uh, out in the mountains. And uh, okay, so the results of the polls, in case you all can't see them, uh, is should the board get involved in this issue regarding solar panels and glare? 66% said no, and 35% said yes. Uh, those, uh, that adds up to about 101%, but that's pretty good. So, um, all right. So here's what my take on that. The next, uh, stay in your lane as a board. Um, in this situation, my advice to the manager uh, and therefore to the board, was to not get involved. And the reason for that is this is a homeowner homeowner issue. The, the association is not going to get involved 
or should not get involved with a dispute between two homeowners because something is a glare shining into their house. Now, people will argue, well, the association approved the solar panels, so they're somewhat, they're, they should be involved here. Um, I doubt that there's an architectural guideline anywhere, and I'm certainly I'm positive there's no restriction in a declaration anywhere that provides that solar panels can be installed as long as they don't glare into somebody's house. Um, the reality here is, if you, it's the facts are that a homeowner submitted plans to install those solar panels. They were installed according to, to what the guidelines were, uh, were. They were approved by the board. That's the end of it. Um, and the, the, here's why the association shouldn't get involved. One, they've already made the decision. Okay, and there was a case that came down that I was involved in at the trial level about this, not about solar panels, but real quick, this was one where uh, there were two homes on a golf course. Uh, one owner put up a, a, a uh, planted a, uh, a bunch of bushes and trees and the neighbor living next door, as those trees grew 10 years later, couldn't see the golf course anymore and filed a lawsuit. Um, they actually sued the association and the board individually. And the question posed was, well, the, the, the main question was, okay, so by impairing the view, should the board have seen 10 years in advance and, and allowed these owners to plant these bushes and trees, knowing that they're going to grow and potentially block the golf course? Um, the Court of Appeals, that, that case actually went to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals found that the association board was not liable. Um, this was not something that the association board members should have been involved in. Um, spending association resources, including money and directed time on matters that are not HOA issues is a breach of duty, in my opinion, because what you're doing is you're taking time and resources away from what you should be doing on behalf of the HOA. Now, um, you can inform the complaining owner that they have the right to bring the action, just like we talked about during the Q&A. They have the right to bring their own action to enforce. But in my, in my opinion, based upon this scenario, I, would, I told the association members, uh, the, the association board, this is not something that you need to get involved in. This is a homeowner to homeowner dispute. Let them work it out um, and go on from there. Um, the fence issue I described uh, during the Q&A is another example. So stay in your lane. If you stay in your lane, you're going to avoid a lot of problems. Um, then there's strength in numbers. And this is one that will also get association boards in trouble. Their strength in numbers, meaning, as I said, with the, with the uh, business judgment rule, you're entitled to and should rely on your managers. And, and I, I write that in there for a purpose. You employ them not just to run the association. These people are experienced. They're educated, they know how to manage. And the key, I think, what you're, what, when you use, have a community manager is the expertise and experience. They've seen and dealt with pretty much everything. And if they haven't, they probably will. Um, you can rely on contractors. You rely on your accountants, your attorneys, and other professionals and experts. There's strength in that because you're protected by the business judgment rule if you rely on them. The other part of this is it's, not all decisions are unanimous, we all know that. But it's imperative that whatever the decision the board makes, whether it's three, two or unanimous, you present a united front. All communications are as a team. If it's three, two, the two that voted against an action should not be going to the membership and saying, hey, the, board, the rest of the board was wrong here. That's not the, that's, that should never happen. Express distension like that leads to dissension in the membership. And frankly, in my opinion, again, is a breach of fiduciary duty. If you are in the minority in a vote and you go talk to the membership about it, you're breaching the confidential uh, aspect of a board decision, board's discussion. It impedes the, the future ability of board members to speak freely, to vote freely. Um, and therefore that, in my opinion, that's not in the best interest of the association. So, uh, their strength in numbers. Um, and moving on to two specific instances. We're at 523, so we got a couple minutes. Be careful what you put in an email. Um, this is a person, this is a case that came to me a number of years ago. 
I represented an association that an owner wanted to buy a piece of common area from, from the association. The board initially said yes, and then called me and I said, oh, by the way, you can't just sell it. You need 80% of the membership to approve it. So then the board went back to that owner and said, no, you can't buy it. The owner then proceeded to send an email to the board and copy the entire membership. It was about five pages of blather. Uh, it was uh, entertaining to say the least. The board, upon receipt of that, drafted a very well-written six-paragraph response, which was great until the beginning of the sixth paragraph, when they started that paragraph with, as the saying goes, we do not negotiate with terrorists. They hit reply all, so all 250 members of the association saw that email. Why did I say be careful? Because that owner, uh, the disgruntled owner who wrote the initial five pages of blather sued the association and the directors for defamation. We won the case, there was no defamation because it was not, wasn't even an opinion, they didn't call him a terrorist. But it cost $10,000 in the DNO uh, in legal fees and the DNO coverage didn't cover it. And I thank that board every year, uh, basically every day when I get in my new car uh, that I used uh, those fees to buy. So I'm, I'm joking on that. But be careful. Uh, communications and uh, are, are, can lead to claims against the association and you personally. Um, the second thing, uh, as I put in this, is never say in a meeting that'll teach them. I was in a board meeting a number of years ago in a condo association, a very nice condominium association that had very specific rental restrictions in place. There was uh, an owner who was renting the unit and using a loophole that was written into the restrictions. I did not write those restrict restrictions, but there was a loophole in there and the board did not like it. There was back and forth uh, between this owner and one specific board member who was also an attorney. Um, the board had a hearing and ended up uh, deciding to find this owner. And at the end of that discussion, the board member audibly said while the owner was leaving the room, that'll teach him. That did not bode well. It looks like personal action. Um, we ended up diffusing the situation, but that is a prime example of something where a personal vendetta by a board member could have gotten the association in trouble and could have gotten himself in trouble. So please be careful about communication and personal grudges that will open you up personally and the association potentially up to liability. Um, so let me sum up. We're at 526. Uh, to sum up, most threats are empty. Um, most of it is uh, showboating. Most of it is trying to knock you off your game, distract you to get you to either succumb to their wishes or simply to distract. Remember that. Um, second, your primary job as a director is to fulfill your fiduciary duty. If you breach it, that's when you might get sued personally. Know your indemnity provisions of your bylaws, know the statute, um, and please uh, know your insurance policies. And if you don't have DNO insurance, get it. Um, stay away from neighbor to neighbor disputes. Uh, for the reasons I stated, it could be a breach of fiduciary duty to devote time and resources to a dispute that's just between neighbors. Speak as a unit. Uh, and finally, use all of your resources. Um, that, that's, that's it. Uh, that's the webinar. That's what I wanted to discuss. I want to thank, uh, we're going to hand out Oscars to Kate Ahoy. She was the director uh, in the videos our, uh, and Michaela Richardson, our, uh, pers our, our uh, PR person. And screenplay is run by, well, that, the, the script for that was written by my HOA paralegal. Um, so I want to thank them for, for doing that. And we're back to questions, anyone. So, well, we've had a few more come in and we'll probably go on another uh, 10, 15 minutes if that's okay with you, Chris. No so, problem. Um, and I apologize, you get a lawyer talking, we just go. So, so I, I think we may have answered this next question in one of our earlier webinars about uh, political signs and um, well, maybe the six o'clock news rule, uh, but our CCNRs have the governance, have governance against flags and signs in the yard. We still have homeowners 
displaying BLM flags and other political signs. Um, we have seen a number of lawsuits asking these to be removed. We are only following our guidelines, nothing political. Can we enforce the removal of flags and signs? Well, um, if this was addressed by a previous attorney in a previous webinar, I hope I don't contradict them. Um, and the six o'clock rule applies here. But understand that if you're in North Carolina, political signs are can be limited. Um, the question becomes whether something is a political sign or a social sign, a, a, a social activist sign. There is a difference. Uh, political signs in the North Carolina Planned Community Act are specifically defined as to what they are. So if it doesn't meet that criteria, I would say you have the ability to enforce removal. I'm not saying you should, considering if it's a sensitive issue. If there are lawsuits pending about this in your association, um, you may want to see how let those run their course. I would want to read your, your specific restrictions to determine uh, to, before I could give you a really hard answer on that. So the general one is if it's political signs can be regulated if the language is in there. Other signs can be regulated if the restrictions specifically allow for you to regulate them. And, and in, when we're outside of a political season, political signs aren't even allowed if your restrictions prohibit them. So if you have restrictions that limit signage or restrict them or prohibit them, you have a duty to follow your restrictions and enforce them. That's what I'm gonna tell you. If something is a social, if it's a social issue sign, I do not know of any inherent protections for those signs um, based upon, again, whatever your restrictions contain. So I probably just gave you a non-answer, but, but those are sensitive. Generally speaking, my answer is going to be enforce your restrictions because that's what you have the fiduciary duty to do. So this might be a quick one. Um, okay. You spoke of the indemnity clause in the documents. Yes. Uh, which documents could we find them in? Okay, those are generally found in your bylaws. Now, the, the difference between declaration and bylaws, your declaration of covenants restrictions, your declaration of condominium in South Carolina, your master deed, uh, if you have a condominium, um, it generally won't have those. Um, maybe in condominium documents, you might see them, but 95% of the time, if not more, they're gonna be in your association bylaws, probably towards the back after the uh, officer section. That's normally where they're found. Okay. Uh, we have a situation where a condo owner has been continuously harassing our landscapers because he believes debris is getting blown up against his car. Our documents don't seem to cover how to address this. And I'm concerned that the ramifications to the board might be if we tried to get involved uh, with the situation. Uh, we've communicated the complaint to the landscaper uh, but the owner is uh, continuing to uh, cause some concern. Um, any, any suggestions on handling this issue? I would advise that board or uh, to let that owner, complaining owner know that they've addressed it with the landscaper. And if he feels that there's an, they should, there's an issue that he should uh, take action against the landscaper, the association has done what it can do. Uh, would there be a conflict of interest with a board member who is a licensed realtor listing properties in his or her HOA? It is a conflict of interest because every, almost everything is a conflict of interest. If it is dis the, the, the requirements of the statute are to dis that the conflict of interest must be disclosed. If it's approved by the board, it's fine. If it's approved by the membership, it's fine. If it's not approved by the board and it's not or it's not disclosed to the membership and the deal is fair, it's still fine. Now, it, this comes down to does it look bad? It looks bad. Um, but there is no I, I cannot tell you that there is any prohibition on that. Um, I think if it's disclosed, 
the, the recourse to the board is to inform the membership and the membership, if they wish to have that board member removed, they can call a special meeting and do so. Um, I would advise the board member to, uh, who is selling that property uh, to try to focus his business elsewhere. But I cannot inherently tell you that it is, a, it is something that would warrant action beyond removal by the membership if they choose to. Okay. This next question may be more for an insurance agent, but uh, what DNO limits do you recommend and also endorse DNO on general liability policy or a standalone DNO policy? Uh, let me address the second one first. DNO policies are generally standalone. Uh, sometimes they are uh, tag alongs with liability. Um, talk to your agent, see where the, uh, in my opinion, uh, it doesn't really matter as long as you're covered. Um, it really depends on what your, you and your agent prefer. As to limits, you need to talk to your insurance professional about that. Generally speaking, what I've seen, um, depending on the size of the neighborhood and what amenities you have, uh, your policy limits are normally at least a million. Uh, sometimes uh, I know I'm not, I'm not going to disclose, not, not going to uh, breach any confidentiality uh, that my association, it's two million. The reason it's two million, we upped it a couple of years ago because we have a boat dock um, where people could uh, potentially uh, be injured and we didn't want to face that. So we, we upped our liability coverage and I think we upped our DNO coverage as well. So, but yeah, I would say with, with, go ahead. With standalone policies and you know, package policies, uh, you get into non-monetary and monetary exclusions. So you, you definitely want to look into um, yes. what has what with those. Um, next question, is there an open meeting law in South Carolina? That is a quorum can only confer if the announce of a meeting. I think that's the question. Um, okay, the open meeting law, uh, I know of no open meeting statute in South Carolina. Um, if your bylaws require meetings be open, they must be open. Uh, open meeting, you must allow members to attend if they so choose. Um, the, the term open is a loaded one. Um, do you have to allow them to speak? No, you do not. Open meetings mean that you allow them to come and watch what goes on. In North Carolina, there is obviously no statute. But in North Carolina, many people gloss over the portion of the statute that talks about that the boards are required to meet with their members at regular intervals. You can go ahead and fill in the blank on whatever regular interval means. No one really knows. But nevertheless, there is a requirement that boards in North Carolina meet with their members regularly. So in South Carolina, there's no open meeting membership uh, requirement. The, I'm not, I didn't understand the second part of that about a quorum. I, I don't know, um, but I'll ask the next one. Okay. <laughs> do, do, do you recommend a fidelity bond in addition to the DNO coverage? Again, maybe. Um, that's, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's an insurance question. Um, I do know, and Ben, you may know this, there was a, a statute being proposed in North Carolina that was gonna require certain coverage for management companies like that. Did that pass? It, it has not passed. It has not it's passed. been on the docket, I think the last six to eight years and um, been yeah. put in the committee every time. And, and you know, that, I think uh, that, that got some traction a couple of years ago after there was a management company in Raleigh that kind of absconded with some things. Um, so do I, do I recommend it? I, I've never had to deal with it, um, but it's something you should talk to your agent about. Okay, uh, this is a good one. A belligerent resident says that I'm going to destroy you on social media because lawyers are expensive. <laughs> um, because you were elected, I can say whatever I want, whether it's true or not. Okay. How do you handle that? <laughs> as a board member, you handle it as any other uh, member coming to you. Um, the reality is you volunteered for this. You are going to be, I, 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 I personally been called an agent of Satan. 
Uh, and that was in my attorney role and as a board member. So, you, I mean, it's something consistent, I guess. Um, but some of it you're just going to have to deal with. Uh, my board and I are raked over the coals, are slammed uh, repeatedly on next door. It is, um, we routinely have calls where we basically, uh, for lack of a better term, vomit ourselves all over the call to get out our angst so that we don't then do something stupid and reply back on social media that gets us in trouble. And I am one of the hotheads and I'm an attorney and I deal with this all the time, but when it's personal, it does take on a different light. Um, that said, if there is something published on social media that is blatantly false, blatantly attacking, attacking character um, and, and defamatory in nature, you can take steps to have that stopped. It's starting with the cease and desist all the way to the litigation if you want to take it that far. Um, your reputation as a person, your reputation as a board, if it is attacked by lies versus opinion, is actionable. I don't recommend getting involved in the defamatory litigation because it's expensive and hard to win and damages are basically impossible to prove. But nevertheless, if, the, if, if someone is slamming you on social media and it is opinion, it's protected speech. If it is, on the other hand, attacking your decisions, it is perfectly reasonable for the board to get together and post something on, not on that social media, but on the website saying, okay, this is what we did and why we did. Um, Communication to the membership about board decisions normally makes that stuff go away. Again, I will draw on personal experience from my board. We have about five people that like to post stuff. When we put facts out, it'll die down then for two or three months, and then they'll come up with something else, and then they throw it back on social media, and we have to address it or not. So, so um do we need to create, uh, cre sorry, treat a violating owner any differently if they are an attorney? So a violation of the covenants. Do we need to treat a, viola a violator of the covenants any differently if they are an attorney? Only if it's me. <laughs> and if uh, I know one of my board members is on, if you're saying I'm in violations, come talk to me. No, um, no, you treat all, all owners the same. I'm not sure why you would, you would, uh, a member's a member, whether they're an attorney, a doctor, whatever. Um, now, I will say that if they are an attorney and they don't practice HOA law and start to give you legal opinion about why they're right and you're wrong, um, I think we go back to the beginning of, our, of the presentation and say, all right, well, you know, we've made our decision and uh, you can contact our HOA attorney um, if you differ, differ with that. If the policies and procedures are not followed relating to contracts and competitive bids over stated amounts, is this a breach of fiduciary responsibility? I'm not sure I understand that. I'm going to, I'm going to take a, take a shot. If there are specific policy adopted by the board for the adopting of contracts for vendors, for example, in the community, and that policy is not followed, is that a breach of fiduciary duty? It can be. Um, I would probably need more information, though. Um, the, the, if, if the board of directors takes the time to adopt a policy on how it should adopt contracts and enter into contracts, if there's a specific reason not to follow it in a certain instance, if they document it, then it's probably fine. On the other hand, they should. You all took the time to adopt the policy. You should follow it. If you don't, and you don't give a good reason why, is it a breach of fiduciary duty? I think it could be. Yeah. When an owner does damage to the common area, and the board decides not to charge the owner for damage, do you consider that a good use of business judgment? <laughs> um, there are a lot of reasons not to pursue an owner for that. Um, so I would need more information. Um, the, statutorily, if your documents allow for you to assess an owner for arid, for damage caused to the common area, um, the statute allows you to assess those costs. Um, I would say do that, but 
there's always reasons not to. Everything from that owner doesn't have the money to uh, there's other extenuating circumstances. I would need more information to give a solid answer on that. Okay, um, back to your tree question or the tree issue previously. We have lots of common areas. Uh, some trees are getting, getting tr tr big and or diseased. We can't cut every tree. Mm -hmm. If someone calls and requests a tree to be cut and we don't, and then it falls on a house, are we liable? If, if we don't have any information that the tree that they want cut is, is dead or diseased, then I would, then my recommendation is you get to that tree in your, in your standard of priority. If you're going to get through the neighborhood periodically and there's nothing wrong with that tree, then there's nothing wrong with that tree. Trees fall, trees fall by acts of God, trees fall because of rain and windstorms, and that's basic tree law. However, if an owner is telling you a tree is overgrown and you need to cut it, I would, at a, I suggest, I would recommend that you send someone out there to take a look at that tree and make sure it's not diseased because what that owner is doing is looking for a lawsuit. So, I don't know if that answers it, but that's. We asked owners if they rent out their unit uh, to help determine the percentage of owner occupied units versus rented units for people trying to get loans. Uh, we received pushback that we should not be asking this question. Um, is that a question that is okay to ask? And, you know, are we um, at risk of discrimination or any other action? Asking a question is never the cause of getting you sued. Um, you, you can ask anything. Uh, well, that's probably not a fair statement. It, 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 that question itself, there's no problem in asking it. The question is whether you can, you can require that it be turned over. Um, and that is going to have to be in your restriction somewhere to require that to be turned over. Otherwise, yes, if owners wish to cooperate, you can certainly ask a question, would you hand it over so we can get a count? They say, yes, great. That's their choice. Um, Asking the question of itself is, in my opinion, would not open you up to any liability and not wouldn't you open you up to any, any uh, liability for discrimination either. It's simply a question. And your basis for asking the question is for what I'm assuming is FHA financing purposes. So uh, I'll, I'm going to go uh, maybe two or three more questions. Uh, lots of questions keep coming in and um, I'm trying to get to them all. But um, well, let you know if you want to send them to me. I'll do what I can. <laughs> well, we, I mean, we can keep going. There's still a hundred and plus people with us. That, um, oh, wow. Okay. I, so, I, I um, have more questions and answers. That's bad, Ben. Sorry. Go ahead. Liability, COVID, and pools. So getting into pool season mm -hmm. uh, with COVID restrictions still in place. I know uh, North Carolina is um, still on the, um, phase two with pools. Um, an executive order from, I think, May or March um, is still in effect. So what sort of liability um, do we have opening our pools in this time of COVID? Well, as it happens, I blogged on that last March, but I forgot about, I forgot what I wrote, but I, I'll see if I can get that back uh, uh, in, in the forefront of my brain. I don't think, I don't know if it's North or South Carolina, but I almost just speak generally speaking. The governor's made clear they're not gonna have roving patrols. I think the issues for associations are, are there going to be reports by owners to the health department or something that could, would result in investigation and the pulling of your, your permit to, to operate the pool. Um, liability wise, the, the general thinking is this, um, someone does not have COVID. When they leave their house, they go to the pool. The next day they have COVID. Is it the association's fault if they went to the pool when they left their house? The answer to that is it's a proof issue. How in the world is they going to be able to prove that they caught COVID by going to the pool? It, it's impossible. Um, it, there's, and and I, there is a case I saw, I want to say it's out of Texas, somewhere out southwest, uh, where that very issue came up. Um, the court let it survive a motion to dismiss, but then I believe summary judgment went in favor of the association or something like that. I have to, I will have to pull that up. That that came out last November or something. 
Um, so is there a liability? And I'm going back to the, to the premise of this thing. You can be sued for anything as an association. You'd be sued anything as a person. Does that mean that you're going to be liable? In this situation, I just don't see how there could be proof from one that, you know, unless a person was encased in a bubble, rolled themselves in that bubble down to the pool. But even then, um, if the association has signs up that says, you know, keep, so, keep your social distancing, wear your mask when you're not in the pool, uh, it keeps the capacity requirements uh, to where they need to be, which I believe is 50% is Ben. Um, the association is acting in compliance with the governor's order. Open your pool. Um, I, don't, I don't see, I, there may be a difference of opinion amongst us that practice in this, but I think liability would be tough to prove. Now, that doesn't mean you won't have to defend a lawsuit. And I know insurance companies are balking at the idea of defending them. But um, if, if, if you can comply, I don't see liability. And I believe the governor at least in North Carolina, put that out there. If, uh, there's, there's a corollary to that, where if you are complying, you're not going to get liability. I believe the pool companies put something out on that. Um, on the other hand, if you do not think you can comply, I had a number of associations, some very big ones, that decided not to open their pool this past year because they just didn't want to deal with it. They didn't want to deal with the hassle. And they had probably more complaints from their owners not opening than the ones that did open. Um, so it's all in the battle you want to fight, I guess. But, in, but going back to it, I think it's going to be tough to prove liability against anyone. And uh, just to share my opinion, I think we will see more pools opening this year than not. Um, but make sure you have the signs up. Um, and who knows what the governor may do in the next two to three months before pools start to open. Um, but a, a lot of communities have tried to hire guards to help um, monitor the um, you know, 50% capacity issues. But uh, certainly get with your manager, get with your pool, pool company to discuss. Yep. Uh, my master declaration states that a property, if a property is not maintained, board can have the property cleaned up and send a reasonable bill to the property owner. Is this a valid clause and should the board do it? Two questions. Is it a valid clause? Yes. Should the board do it? No. Oh, you want me to explain that further? <laughs> I will. Um, Self-help provisions are all over declarations. Uh, they're all over restrictions. Uh, that one I see all the time. Uh, I uh, have never given an opinion to an association to enter upon a private property, to clean that property up and send that owner a bill. I have never given an opinion to an association to clean the property up and not send them a bill. Entering on the private property is a good way to get sued. Um, I, I hearken back to a case I heard about from Charlotte where an association went on and cut some grass on a, on a lot that had fallen into disrepair and cut a prized tomato plant and got sued and lost. Um, if you are as an association dying to get onto a property to uh, cut the grass, maintain it, do what you want to do. If you're that, if you're that adamant about it, go get a court order. If you have a court order that says you can get on that property, you are protected at law for what happens on there as long as you're acting reasonably. Um, you cannot be charged with trespass. Uh, you, you are, and again, you're protected. So um, I've had one association that I represented. It was the tree case that I talked about with the, with the golf course, the, the screen of trees. Uh, the board ended up going onto that property because it got an order uh, to, that it could go on there and cut the trees down. Um, I, I was fine with that because the court is, is allowing you to do it. Um, the self-help provisions are loaded with pitfalls. Um, and, you know, the argument is, well, you know, you buy a property in here, you agree that, that the association can do that. Yes, that's true, but that doesn't mean you should. I'll just mention it's I think it's been about 10 years, maybe maybe longer. Um, we had a board member killed in the Charlotte area um, going on the property. 
and uh, over trees as well. And so this was in the Concord area. Um, it's 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 not. A, I I will never recommend it. Um, you know, you have available to you the ability to fine, the ability to uh, suspend services. If the fine's not paid, you have the ability to lien and potentially foreclose. You have other avenues to you besides risking personal health uh, and the health of your contractor um, and facing other liabilities by going onto a property. I'll just, that, that was not a CAMS community, by the way. So. That's good. A <laughs> <laughs> um, few more questions. Um, See, what if the dispute with the roof was approved by the board um, and installed correctly, but the homeowner across the street thinks that is not pleasing to them? The homeowner complaining is threatening legal action. Um, how should the board handle? Uh, the board should handle that by simply, if, if it's an inquiry in writing, is reply in writing that the, the roof was approved. It is, it is uh, uh, the architect, it is compliant with the architectural guidelines. And if that owner believes that uh, it is out of compliance, it can take whatever action it needs. To, to I think that's your, your second video. Yes. Someone address that. So. Exactly. Um, if a board member is suspected of sharing uh, board business emails with the general membership, what action should the board take to that owner or that board member? without knowing more of what's contained in the bylaws, what action the board should take is one, talk to that uh, board member to confirm that this is happening. And two, in my opinion, that is a breach of fiduciary duty and the board should consider calling a special meeting to remove that person. Should owners be advised of an impending major increase in maintenance cost before the board has determined if there will actually be an increase. So I guess the, the question is, should the board or should the residents be involved in the discussion about a potential increase in assessments? I don't think it ever hurts to be transparent and get member involvement. In the end, 95% of the time, all the financial decisions are made by the board. So the board itself doesn't have to get anybody involved unless there's something in the restrictions that says otherwise. Depending upon the expenditure, there may be something in there and the, the, the cost of it. Uh, however, um, the more transparent a board is, the more communication it has with the membership, if it ends up that it has to have that increase in expenses, everybody knows about it in advance. Um, so I, I, I'm usually very conservative in my recommendations in disclosing information in the situation where there could be a, a large expense, a large increase, it is, I would rec I recommend to boards that as much information as you can discuss with your membership is the better. Um, in the end, the board still makes the decision 90% of the time. So, um, but it doesn't hurt to get it. If nothing else, getting the members up with the understanding, look, uh, we're going to have an increase in expenses. If you have other ideas, great. Um, let's hear them. Uh, that's always helpful. So here's an interesting liability question. Can a current board, can current board members be held liable for previous board members' actions or inactions on capital improvement needs over prior years to main condo buildings? Personally liable? No. Um, a current board was not involved in making the decisions of the past. Uh, there's not going to be any personal liability to a board member there. Will the association, however, uh, be liable as an entity? Potentially, yes. Um, even if the current board is changing, you know, is changing the direction or is now taking action, uh, it's very, it's possible that the association as a whole could be liable for non non maintenance that's required to do. So, is an HOA member of any community or or any of the community members legally allowed to run a personally administered Facebook group or page or any other social media 
in the registered name of the subdivision. Okay. Um, first of all, let me, let me address that, the first part, even though it's all one question. A board member, a member can run a Facebook page on anything they want. Um, if it's not association sanctioned, the association or mandated or, or in, it's not in control of the association, the association has no control what's get, what gets posted. Now, can they, what was the last part of that again uh, about? Uh, I guess it, it has more to do maybe with trademark issues or using uh, the association's name. Okay, well, trade, here, here's what trademark or copyright protects. See, a copyright, if I write a book, uh, it, it prohibits you from taking the contents of that book and calling it your own. A trademark, a trademark law is there to protect uh, business owners, owners of a certain trade from having their business confused with others for, with a similar mark. The use of the association logo, the, the use of the association, um, I don't know, pictures or something. Well, pictures are different. They say the, associ the association logo in, uh, on, a, on a website saying that this is the website of the HOA. It's not the use of the logo that's the issue. It, it could be that the problem is that that website or that Facebook page could be, depending on how it's worded, um, it could be deemed that the association is endorsing whatever's being placed up there. And that's the problem. If there is an, a board, especially if it's a board member who's got their own website their own Facebook page and has the association logo up there. That to me, if I'm logging into that, I'm a member of that association. And I see Joe, who's a board member having his website and saying, Hey, uh, you know, this is the authorized site. That's a problem. If the rest of the board is not involved in whatever gets put up there. So there's where um, that is a problem. That is legally speaking, um, the association would need, in my opinion, would need to take action to stop that representation. Uh, this, this, that, that website, that Facebook page would need to say, this is the personal page of Joe um, and not of the association. And if that owner or board member won't take it down, you know, we'd have to take some steps to make them do it. So it, it is just after six o'clock. Um, there are several more questions, but I'm going to ask one last one last question. So, um, sure. But um, a homeowner submitted an ARC request for a country red metal roof. There is only one other metal roof in the neighborhood. The covenants only specify consistency and do not specify roof types or colors. The metal roof was approved. Now the neighbor is unhappy and wants the metal roof replaced. How should the board handle and is there a liability for not addressing? The board should handle it. If it was approved, it's approved. Um, the board should not now go back on its decision to approve it. And the reason for that is you've got one other one in the community. So you have the ability to rely on past decisions. I wouldn't necessarily call it precedent, but it's not like you've, you've got a purple roof and there's no other purple roofs. You have one other metal roof in the community. Uh, there, apparently there was a, a valid architectural request. The architectural committee made a valid decision. Uh, the response to this owner should be, if you believe this is in violation of the restrictions, which it doesn't sound like to me it is, if you believe it's in violation of restrictions, you have the opportunity to go ahead and try to enforce it yourself. Um, where associations get into trouble uh, is making a decision, informing the owner of the decision, whatever it is, and then changing their mind later. Uh, that can open up liability potentially. In the situation here, do I see liability on behalf of the individual board members now? You made a business decision based upon what the architectural committee told you or maybe you are the architect for me, I don't know. Do I see the association having liability? I do not see it having uh, potential monetary liability. It could be, I, I guess, if the case, if there was a case filed and went, a court could certainly say, hey, you know what, this, this was out, outside the boundaries, but I don't think so. And the reason for that is because these architectural guidelines, 
are, are simply guidelines. They are fuzzy. They are given the, the, the discretion in the end is given to the committee and the board on what to approve. So, you know, it's not like in a, it, it would be one thing if you were in a community that said no modular homes and a modular came in and you approved it. That's a problem. This is, you know, there's no specifications on roofs. You've got another metal roof in the association. I, you know, I defend that case. I defend that. And, and, and I'm going to say one other point. Many times when an opinion is asked of an attorney, the question, at least of me, I ask myself, would I, be, would I be willing to defend this decision? And if I'm not, then I'm going to tell the board you're wrong. In that situation, I'd be willing to defend that. Yeah. Okay. Well, there are a number of other questions. I do apologize, not able to get through them all. Um, but Chris, I want to thank you for your time this evening. Sure. Um, I, we look forward to our next webinar. Uh, we are doing webinars on the third Thursday. So we hope that you will continue to join us for these informative sessions. Um, but Chris, thank you again. And um, camsmgt.com webinars. It's under the board member section if you'd like to share this with any of your, your fellow board members. So again, thank you and, and good night. Good night all. Thank you for coming.